I'm Marcus Rich. I'm the CEO of uh, Time Inc. Uh, UK. As you can see, um, I'm flying in from the UK as the flag shows. If there's any Scotsman in the audience, I'm sorry about what happened at Murrayfield. There isn't any Scotsman in the audience. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is actually um, two things. One is, I actually think this is a unique time for us. Never has our content been more valuable. Never has our reach been greater. And three key words that I want to talk through. One content, one trust, and one data. And to try and show how we're starting to put in action, one, how we can grow our consumer revenue streams, and two, how we can grow our advertising revenue streams. So, a little bit about us. We're 60 brands, largely split across three distinct audiences. Uh, first is connected women, which would be called, in traditional TV terms, housewives with children. The second is what we call Gen Y Not, which is a growing audience of influential 40-plus ABC1 women. And the third is what we call Super ABs. So we reach more C-suite individuals in their leisure time than The Economist does uh, at work. And I'll come on and talk a little bit more about that. But this is really the key to the business. And that is passionate, passionate consumers. I always like to say that people like television, people like radio, people even like the internet, but people love their hobbies and their pastime. And they spend a disproportionate amount of their time and money uh, in this particular marketplace. And whether you're a mammal, which is a middle-aged men wearing lycra, which is the fastest glow in sport, uh, whether you're a wine buff, whether you're a beauty buff, whether you're a golfer, etc. And the real change is here is that content is the key. People trust and value the content in these markets above anything else. And the killer change is we're now starting to build up data around that content that I believe gives us a unique position at the top table that we'll come on to. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, consumer revenues. And this is just a process that we go through. We call it interrogating the ecosystem. And the circle is an analysis by every single vertical, every single market that we are in, of where the consumer actually spends their money. Where are they spending that hard-earned money on the most important thing in their life, which is their pastime? And can you then build from a position in print, sometimes not a position in print, start building through data and working out in that ecosystem, can you launch or acquire into those businesses that are complementary to your existing brand? And that's against a backdrop of change, and it's a permanent change. Um, so currently, from our standpoint, 62% of our digital consumption comes via mobile, and only 15% of the revenues, that would be the norm, although I think native will, will change, actually, the way we can generate money from mobile. There's an increasing competition for social, particularly among the millennial audience, and there's a growing adoption of ad-blocking technology. <clears throat> Every couple of weeks, I get all the new joiners in the company together. So they're generally aged between about 18 and 21. Talk to them about the company, etc. And I ask the question at the end, how many of you are using ad blockers? And generally, 70% of them say they're using ad blockers. And that's starting to change the way we compete in the business. On the other side, there's a growing concern about viewability, but I think that's an opportunity for premium publishers. And I'm going to come on and talk about how native and video, I believe, is a huge opportunity for us to grow advertising revenue. But this is the absolute key point. Despite all those key trends, people will always want to hear a great story well told. My belief, I think previous speakers said it as well, the people who are the best storytellers are us. And if we're able to marry our content with data, then it gives us a fantastic opportunity to start building new headline revenue growth. 
Here's a live example I just want to go through. So this is uh, equestrian, which actually is a growing market here. There's two or three riders now on the FEI World Tour. This is show jumping. And it's a big marketplace for us. So taking that model, the UK equestrian market is worth 3.8 billion pounds in England. And it breaks down in terms of that detail about how consumers spend their money. From a Time Inc. standpoint, we take about 70% of the available advertising and 70% of the copy sales in that blue box. That's less than 1% of the total expenditure of that consumer in the marketplace. The next stage to look is how the market breaks down. Is it, is it an aggregated market? Are the people supplying these areas around this wheel, are they single companies who have aggregated or is it disaggregated? Is it a marketplace where new technology has advanced the opportunity for people to participate or enjoy their sport? Is there an opportunity for us, and do we have the permission with the brand to either launch in the market or acquire in the marketplace? In this instance, we launched Equo. And Equo is a digital entry system for equestrian events. Now, Equestrian is an incredibly disaggregated marketplace. It's one of the few markets where you send in your entry form by post, you send in your request for stabling by post, you send in your request for hay, you send your request in for hookup by post. You then go to the event. The event organizer has no idea how many people are going to turn up. You use the facilities, i.e. you jump. You might pay at the end. That's a great opportunity for us. And Equo, the digital entry system, is a way for the organizer and the rider to actually pre-book and pre-book all of the areas. And it's one example of taking that ecosystem and entering it. Now, of course, what it absolutely killer thing it gives us is it gives us data. And if we marry that data with the rich data we already have from the subs files, from the tablet data, we can start to A, know who the rider is, how many horses, what they're competing at, what level, and then using that data to then predict behaviors moving out. At what point will they need supplements? What point will they need a new lorry? What point, of course, will they need a new horse, et cetera? And it's that data which will allow us to then say, is there then another opportunity to enter e-commerce in that marketplace? Or events and further experiential areas in that market. But of course, you fall off occasionally. In fact, is there anyone who rides horses in the audience? Do you fall off often? Used to, yeah. I try not to fall off now because I'm getting too old for it, but anyway. Um, you do fall off, and my point of falling off we used to say in the old days, particularly with Chris and Barry, that it was a very simple business model in publishing. You launch four magazines in a year. If three were successful, you got promoted. If two were successful, you kept your job. And if only one was successful, you got fired. Now, of course, the entry into these new ecosystems means they're completely different business models. And we don't know what they're going to look like. And what we do know is we're going to fall off sometimes. And the key bit is being agile, getting back on the horse, and starting again. Now, this is a market that Immediate will love as well, which is the craft market. It's a fabulous area of growth across the whole of Europe and America. Um, and also a real sign that the silver market, which is the older end of the market, which has got high disposable income, is a very attractive area. Three things that are really attractive from our standpoint is one, the power of the relationship between the editors and the readers. So that's the editor of Women's Weekly there. And the big opportunity around experiential in terms of events market and the data that you can generate from marrying your event customer with your print customer to build further businesses, particularly in e-commerce. So exactly the same strategy, 
interesting data points. It's another three million pound marketplace. 93% of our audience knit, and they spend 13 million pounds knitting, and we reach seven and a half million crafters. And in this market, again, from the blue box, we made an acquisition, which was in events, experiential. So that's the fastest growing regional event business for crafting. The next opportunity from that data is to go around the wheel and look at, is there an e-commerce business, is there a membership business, etc. So this is Donald Rumsfeld, and Donald Rumsfeld said, um, we know what we know, and we want know what we don't know, and we don't know what we don't know. Now, not only was he a famous crafter, as you can see from here, but the point from this slide is, we don't know exactly how we're going to generate further consumer revenues. What we do know is people have never been more engaged with our content, People have never had more trust for our brands, and we're collecting more and more data that's allowing us to predict the behaviors, and therefore we can try and move into these new business areas. So I'm gonna move on now, and I want to talk a bit about um, advertising, if that's okay, where content, I think, is even more valuable as we move forward. Now, this is the landscape that we're facing, and there's, there's three data points that I heard last week which were fascinating from my standpoint. The first one was the average tenure of a CMO in Western Europe is about 15 months. The second one was that the majority of boards say that at least 30% of their money should be spent in digital. Um, and the third one is this growing agency position of what they call the bifurcation of media, that the two key platforms that work best together is television and digital. And I would argue at this point, I'm going to show you some data points, that actually the reverse of that, and that there's a number of data points for us in this room that make our story more powerful than ever before to attract increased commercial revenues. This is the first one, the two fastest growing markets. Uh, this is the US numbers, but across the whole of uh, the world will be native advertising growth and video growth. And the killer applications in native and video is the quality of content and the engagement in that content. And my argument would be that we're best placed with our knowledge of the audience to deliver that content partnership to fuel the shift towards native and video. And it wouldn't just be me who's arguing that point. This is from four or five recent studies. The first is Ubiquity, which is a TV-based survey, which shows that print is two and a half times more effective per impact than online display and delivers a greater return. The second is our own research, which backs up the ROI, and I know the American trade body have put advertising guarantees in, such they believe that engagement is greater than any other media. And finally, the other one is about this growing issue of fraud in digital bot farms, which is you're significantly less likely to get non-human traffic in premium publishers, digital, extensions and solutions. And in fact, it was no other than Martin Sorrell who recently said that there's a growing accountability that engagement with print is significantly greater than the term he says, which is so-called new media. And this Millwood Brown survey, which came out a month ago, says that on real long-term sustainable measures for brand effectiveness, print, particularly combined with other platforms, is far more efficient. And finally, agencies are starting to recognize, this is a quote from Lindsay Patterson, that actually this, this over-dominant view of looking at short-term CPA or engagement is actually, it's got to be balanced with the view on what builds brands in the long term. 
And therefore, the final element of why I believe it is a unique time to grow our revenues is we have a more deeply engaged audience in terms of content. Goldman Sachs did a report on what they thought the advertising market would look like in three years' time. And they said this fragmented, low-quality content disaggregated market would consolidate around two principles. Premium publishers with great content and big distributors, which is why we're all currently having the dance with Facebook and Google, etc., about what that looks like. But if you combine that content engagement with the data we're now collecting, which is allowing us to predict consumer behavior, then I think that warrants us a seat at the top table when it comes to marketing plans. And I think there is a, it's kind of definitely an ambition from my standpoint, and it frustrates me hugely when quite often we see marketing and some of the great creativity we saw from the Can Lion presentations, that the buying is relegated to procurement when it's our responsibility to push it up and say, actually, it's about long-term, sustainable, high-quality engagement that builds shareholder value over time. That can't purely be cost per spot or relegated to procurement, which is why I call it work to do. To finish off, really, I think the future, the opportunity is unique at this particular point in time. I don't think we're publishers. I think we're content creators. I don't think we're digital first or print first. I think we're audience first. And I think we're uniquely advantaged with those three key words. The trust we have with our consumers in our brands, the content we create, and the data we generate from that interaction that gives us the opportunity to build businesses in both the consumer revenue stream and the advertising revenue stream. Hi, Marcus. Uh, Gina Johnson, Editorial Director of Motivate. Uh, I just have a question around uh, niche media. We've seen a lot about trends in the growth of niche media brands based around hobbies, and I can see how that plays out in a developed publishing market where there are big populations, so volume becomes important. How do you think that will translate to other markets that have smaller populations? Like, how would niche work in, in smaller markets or more developing markets? Yeah. Um, I mean, it surprised me, actually, when I looked at some of the niches. So if you take uh, Decanter, for example, you know, which is fine wine as a relatively small niche, but actually the business model is completely different in a sense of the print component of it is very small. But actually the experiential component of it is very large. So to a degree I think it plays out, which is each audience, if there's a, a reasonably substantial audience, there is an opportunity to engage in, particularly if you don't start from the principle that the opportunity has to start with print, because it doesn't always. We're seeing a, a huge growth in experiential. You've got it seems that sort of the, I think social media to a degree has changed this. Somebody said to me, why are so many people doing extreme sports? So 5K runs, cycling, etc. And they said, because of social media. It's no longer any good to place on social media. I did a half marathon. That's not attractive. You've got to start doing. So social media is, is developing and really engaging people around experiential. And there's a lot of opportunities for our brands, I believe, to start from the point of, experiential events rather than necessarily publishing.